Well, welcome to the last panel. Uh, hardly the least, hopefully. Uh, certainly not with this lineup. Uh, the last panel of, the conf of, a, of a wonderful conference. Um, I will, as moderator, go last. Uh, I will absorb, if necessary, some of the uh, overtime, if there is any, uh, by the other panelists. Um, we'll leave ample opportunity for comments and questions, of course. Uh, Professor Dworkin may want to say a few remarks, though I understand he might reserve th that response uh, for after lunch. Uh, the order of presentation, we will start with Professor Freeman, uh, move to uh, Professor Michaelman, uh, then Professor Sloan, uh, and then uh, Professor Macedo, uh, Professor Waldron, and myself. Uh, so with that, uh, Professor Freeman uh, can start it off from the University of Pennsylvania Department of Philosophy. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the name of my paper is Equality of Resources, Market Luck, and the Justification of Adjusted Market Distributions. It, it was 30, 30 years ago this month that I entered graduate school, and the first seminar I took was Ronnie's uh, graduate seminar, uh, where he first presented and was the drafts for Equality of Resources and Equality of Welfare. And the paper I wrote for that seminar, as I remember, argued that, well, basically, Equality of Resources expressed the same kind of position as, uh, as Rawls' difference principle. Well, that, that's wrong, and it took me about 30 years to understand the complexities of both positions. Uh, Ronnie will say, not only didn't I understand it then, but I don't understand him now, and he's probably right, uh, but, uh, and I appreciate his comments on this paper, but I'm gonna. Uh, so, Ron, Ronald Orkin's account of distributive justice, the quality of resources, is among the most powerful statements we have of the liberal, liberal democratic ideal of economic justice. In many respects, it captures better than any alternative account the ideal of the American welfare state that grew out of Roosevelt's New Deal, an ideal that's been under severe attack from the right for 30 years. One of the great strengths of Dworkin's account of economic justice is that it's potentially achievable within American society, given our basic political and economic values. For in addition to being fair-minded, Americans are individualistic, and their self-understanding thrives on enjoying vigorous property rights conjoined with opportunities for economic creativity, risk-taking, and bold entrepreneurship. Dworkin's account of economic justice finds a place for these American values, while at the same time mitigating the effects of individual misfortune and providing for a social minimum that guarantees individuals economic independence along with opportunities to develop their capacities and compete with others for social positions. Equality of resources humanizes American capitalism as much as we can possibly hope for in what Ronnie calls the real, real world of American politics. In my paper, however, I focus on Dworkin's ideal real world and the basic standards of economic justice by which we're to critically assess our real world. Dworkin's equality of resources has been categorized as a luck egalitarian view. Now, luck egalitarianism is, I think, an unfortunate term to use in Dworkin's case because it fails to emphasize the crucial role of personal responsibility at the real heart of his position. All luck neutralizing responsibility-based positions, as I would call them, aim to neutralize so far as possible the effects of accidents of birth and circumstance, or brute luck in Ronnie's terms, in the distribution of income and wealth in society. Where the luck neutralizing responsibility-based positions mainly disagree is in their interpretation of personal responsibility and the bearing it should have on economic dist distributions. Thus, Jerry Cohen, with greatest respect for his memory, uh, held that the effect, once the effects of accidents of birth by circum and circumstance are eliminated and the proceeds are equally distributed, people should be rewarded according to their efforts and the arduousness of their positions. To allow inequalities for reasons other than efforts is to allow for undeserved inequalities that are based on accidents of circumstance. Dworkin, however, has a very different understanding regarding the distributive consequences that are required if individuals are to be held responsible for their choices. He assigns a significant role to option luck and market distributions. In Justice for Hedgehogs, he says, we can show both the right concern for people's lives and the right respect for personal responsibility only if we reject ex post theories like utilitarianism and Rawls's difference principle. A free market is not alien to equality, but indispensable to it. An egalitarian economy is a basically capitalist economy. 
Of course, Dworkin does not mean capitalism here in, in any traditional sense. He explicitly rejects the doctrine of laissez-faire and allows for market regulations for the public good as well as mo massive market redistributions required to pay for public goods and the many social insurance plans required by his hypothetical insurance model. The role of the market in settling distributions comes in only once all these questions are settled and adjustments to market incomes are made. Ronnie holds that once a person has paid his or her, her share towards funding public goods and social insurance programs, they have the right to the remaining market returns on their labor and investments. This feature of equality resources I call a person's right to his or her adjusted market income. Now in my paper I raise the question whether Ronnie's requirements that people assume responsibility for their choices justifies relying on markets and the option luck it involves as one of the fundamental criteria for determining distributive shares that people are entitled to. Is market luck a permissible basis for economic inequalities? The reason that uh, Dworkin gives in Justice for Hedgehogs for a right to one's adjusted market distributions is as follows. He says, we respect people's responsibility for their own lives only if we design our economy so that someone can identify and pay the true cost to others of the choices he makes. This is why a community that shows both equal concern and equal respect for its members must put carefully regulated markets at the core of its distributional strategy. Now in my paper, I question the connection that Dworkin sees between taking personal responsibility for one's choices and the justice of adjusted market distributions. I argue that a wide range of economic systems can meet the requirement that people take responsibility for their choices by paying their opportunity costs to others as measured by their market value. The question which of these economic systems is required by justice is not to be decided by looking to the idea of paying one's opportunity costs and taking personal responsibilities for choices. Rather, it's a question of the justice of property relations and other background economic institutions. So just to clarify, uh, markets and the price system can play several different roles within an economic and social system. To begin with, market prices may have the role of allocating scarce productive resources by setting the price for land, labor, capital, and any other productive resources that economic agents use to engage in production of economic goods. In, in addition to this allocative role in production, market prices also may be used to determine the price of consumer goods as well. And then a third role market prices may play is to determine how much of the combined social product particular persons are due as a matter of distributive justice. In that case, market distributions of income and wealth serve as a fundamental criterion of the distributive shares to which people ultimately are entitled. Now the main argument for the allocative role of markets is that pr the price system allocates labor and productive resources efficiently putting them to their most productive use in light of people's preferences for the products that result from them. The argument for the more extensive use of markets to determine not just prices producers must pay, but also prices for consumer goods and services, is that it requires that people pay the opportunity costs or value to others of their choices. People are required to take responsibility for their choices since they have to live within their budget constraints or within limits imposed by their fair share of income and wealth. Now, I argue that neither of these uses of markets in determining prices for productive resources or consumer goods seems to imply anything in particular about how people's distributive shares of income and wealth are to be determined. So long as people are required to pay for the market price of productive resources and goods and services they employ or consume, whether in their role as producers or consumers, they pay their opportunity costs to others and thereby take responsibility for their choices. Of course, an economic system which constantly replenished any income people expended on consumer goods would not, in effect, hold them responsible for their choices and would only encourage profligacy, but that's not the issue here. The issue, rather, is whether there, there is any necessary or clear-cut connection between paying the cost of one's choices to others as determined by their market value and market-based distributions of income and wealth. My argument is that there's not, and thus that paying the opportunity cost of one's choices does not seem to imply anything in particular about who should be on the receiving end and benefit from these payments, or sh who should have property rights to this income and wealth. Um, 
Thus, if I pay for a ticket to watch Wilt Chamberlain or to fly to San Francisco, I've paid my opportunity costs, regardless which person ultimately has rights to receive that income, whether it be Wilt, Wilt's mother due to a promise he's made, or, or the owners of the Philadelphia Warriors pursuant to contractual agreement, or the government or some combination of public and private agents. Taking responsibilities for one's choices does not require that there must be any specific individual or group of private persons on the receiving end who have a property right in the market income paid out for sale of services or property in goods and resources. Um, so, uh, of course, people should receive a fair share for the sale to others of their services and goods and resources, as well as their assumption of market risks. <laughs> it's a role of a conception of distributive justice to determine what a fair return is on the sale to others of these things and for engaging in risky market activities. Uh, there may be a range of possibilities here, each of which may be compatible with using the price system to determine the price of goods and services, and that require people to take responsibility for their choices, including the difference principle and market socialist arrangements. Any conception of distributive justice that relies upon markets to allocate resources and determine prices for goods and services will have to decide what role, if any, markets and market luck should play in the final distribution to individuals of income and wealth. My own view is that markets should play only an instrumental role in establishing distributions whose justice is to be determined by other criteria, namely their effects on the least advantaged members in society. So that's the difference between the views. Gosh, I finally figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.